The Marvel Cinematic Universe has exploded post-Endgame, with tons more content in infinite directions. But how does the new stuff hold up against old classics? As we head into Phase 5, this is every MCU movie released so far ranked. In theory, 2013's The Dark World has everything you could want. In practice, though, it's just not very fun. Chris Hemsworth is as charming as ever, and it's based in part on one of the greatest comic book runs of all time. It's got a Star Wars-style attack on Asgard by spaceships flown by dark elves. It has the rock monsters from Thor's very first comics appearance. Thor and Loki team up for revenge against the villain that killed their mom, climaxing in a fistfight in which Thor and Malekith are literally punching each other so hard that they land in other dimensions. Unfortunately, while all of that sounds good on paper, it's actually both super boring and generally confusing. When Nick Fury showed up at the end of Iron Man and hinted at the idea of a full-on shared universe of superhero movies, fans were thrilled. And then The Incredible Hulk hit theaters a month later to prove you should really be careful what you wish for. It's not that the film is terrible, but it's something almost worse. Forgettable. Which is a real shame when you consider that it does so much right. For one thing, if you're going to make a movie about a nerdy scientist with anger issues so powerful they could level a whole town, getting the guy who starred in Fight Club to play Bruce Banner is a pretty solid move. For another, the filmmakers realized audiences didn't need a full-blown origin story to get up to speed. Tying the Hulk's origin into Captain America and the Super Soldier program was the first stumbling step toward building the full-on shared universe. In the end, though, it just didn't quite land. Critics praised director Chloe Zhao's Eternals for its inclusivity and ambition, but story-wise, it didn't live up to the hype. Unlike the vast majority of MCU movies, Eternals is a little too much like homework. With more than a dozen new heroes and villains, the film feels somehow overstuffed and meandering at the same time. Despite some big names in front of and behind the camera, this cosmic epic turned out undercooked. Discussions over whose fault that is will likely continue for some time. The general consensus in the Hollywood trades was that Oscar winner Zhao was hamstrung by having to adhere to Marvel's strict formula. While it teases some exciting future projects, Eternals on its own is a convoluted mess that ranks embarrassingly low in the MCU standings. You are so pathetic! Sam Rockwell, literally, dancing across the stage to present his army of Iron Man drones is endlessly delightful, but there's a lot in this movie that doesn't involve Justin Hammer busting a move, and that's where it fails to measure up. Hammer and Whiplash both serve as evil versions of Tony Stark, bringing unnecessary complications to the story. Even worse, the scene when Stark goes down into his basement with a particle accelerator to somehow build a new element might be the goofiest thing in the entire MCU, and those movies have a talking raccoon from space. At the same time, Iron Man 2 was a confident stride towards the full MCU, introducing the Black Widow and War Machine, and even teasing Thor's arrival in the next film. There's a lot there to like, and even if it's outweighed by the bad stuff, we'll always have Justin Hammer's dance moves. Iron Man 2 might have been the first big step toward fleshing out the Marvel Universe, but Thor was the first time we actually got to see its scope in action. With Thor, we got Asgard in all its glory, complete with a rainbow laser bridge, epic battles against frost giants, and perhaps most importantly, those big old Jack Kirby hats that Norse gods apparently love to wear. It even gave us a Viking god robot with a face made of death lasers, and it introduced arguably the best villain in the whole MCU, Loki. Like Thor The Dark World, though, the original Thor film somehow ended up feeling like less than the sum of its parts. It should have been great, but ended up merely… okay. Iron Man 3 tried to do something different, and it succeeded brilliantly. Unfortunately, what it was trying to do was defy expectations by completely undermining everything fans loved about Iron Man in the MCU. Iron Man 3 explores how the smartest guy in the room deals with living in a world that's becoming something that he can't predict, 
It's a movie about a superhero with an anxiety disorder, which results in Iron Man spending the entire movie not wanting to be Iron Man and thus being Iron Man as little as possible. Plus, there was the whole fake Mandarin thing, which some people love, but most fans were either confused or disappointed by it. Director Shane Black deserves credit for his bold vision, which made for a good movie, just not a good Marvel movie. When 2016's Doctor Strange was announced, the big question for comics fans was how the mind-bending psychedelic sorcery of the mystical Marvel Universe was going to fit into the MCU. As comics fans know, things get pretty weird. And from a visual standpoint, the filmmakers absolutely nailed it. The splitting realities in the movie's fight scenes were beautifully weird, and the ghostly ethereal plane where life and death battles for the fate of the Earth could rage unseen was great for showing how different Stephen Strange's world was. From a story standpoint, though, it seemed a little too familiar, as the story beats were basically Iron Man with magic. Still, you can do worse than copying one of the most popular superhero films ever, and the fantastic climax with Strange's time-bending bargain with Dormammu is one of the best finales in the MCU to date. Juggling a massive cast of superheroes is a difficult task, and while Avengers Age of Ultron doesn't manage it quite as well as the other three Avengers films, or Captain America Civil War, it does a pretty good job of balancing character bits with all-out action. Sure. Some parts seem half-baked, like Tony Stark apparently forgetting every lesson he learned in Iron Man 3 and Thor's weird spirit quest, but it boasts a great final battle, not to mention the introduction of fan-favorite characters Vision and the Scarlet Witch. Avengers Age of Ultron isn't perfect, but it still packs in a lot of fun. All the way back in 2010, producer Kevin Feige confirmed that a solo outing for Natasha Romanoff was in the pipeline. But over a decade would pass before Black Widow hit Cineplexes and Disney+. Plus. Taking place right after the events of Captain America Civil War, Kate Shortland's prequel sends Natasha back to Budapest to deal with her past. There, she teams up with Yelena Belova, a fellow Red Room trainee who once posed as Romanoff's sister to take down the Black Widow program. Watching Romanoff right her wrongs after so many years is undeniably satisfying, and Black Widow benefits from the fact that it largely stands alone. It's a gripping watch and a worthy send-off for an OG Avenger. Like the... This, this thing that you do when you whip your hair when you're fighting with the... Is Thor Love and Thunder as good as Thor Ragnarok? No. Is it still a rollicking good time? You bet! Where else are you going to see Chris Hemsworth fight evil aliens to the rockin' tunes of Guns N' Roses? Where else are you going to see two giant screaming goats pull a viking ship along a magic rainbow? Where else are you going to see Russell Crowe hamming it up as the Greek god Zeus? Nowhere! except in this mad, wild world that director Taika Waititi has created. Thor may have lost all the weight he gained after Infinity War, but he's still missing something huge. Love. Enter Jane Foster, Thor's old flame, recently imbued with the power of Mjolnir. Now, there are two Thors running around, making nervous eyes at each other, wondering if they can take a second shot at their relationship, or if putting themselves out there again is too emotionally risky. Plus, there's a deity-slaying madman named Gore the God Butcher on the loose, looking to get revenge for his dead daughter by living up to his very evocative nickname. Sure, not every joke in Love and Thunder lands. Yeah, sometimes it gets a bit too zany for its own good. But when the jokes do land, they are hilarious. And for the first time in Thor history, the relationship between Jane Foster and the God of Thunder actually works. And Natalie Portman absolutely shines in the role of Mighty Thor. The first Guardians of the Galaxy movie proved that the MCU could get weird and cosmic and still be incredibly entertaining. The second one proved that it wasn't a fluke. If anything, it went bigger. The first movie brought us stuff like the Nova Corps and Ronan the Accuser, but Volume 2 has about a half hour of superheroes battling Ego the Living Planet. It's got waves of space drones swarming into starship battles, a warp drive sequence that knows exactly how silly it is, and it features the best Stan Lee cameo in cinema history and the single best use of a Zoom in anything ever. It's tempting to say, Ant-Man shouldn't have worked as well as it did, 
and that, a second tier superhero with the ability to get really tiny and talk to ants was a big surprise when it started to rake in hundreds of millions of dollars. Really though, it's not that unexpected. After all, Marvel's first big movie success came from a pretty obscure D-lister from the pages of Tomb of Dracula. Audiences have always been interested in stories that twist the expected superhero plot points around into something new, and that's where Ant-Man really delivers. As easy as it would have been to portray Scott Lang as a microscopic version of Iron Man, his story felt different. Hey, are we the good guys? Yeah. We're, we're the good guys, man. Right? Yeah, we're the good guys. Feels kind of, kind of weird, you know? The movie has its missteps, like going out of its way to justify not having the Wasp show up until the sequel, but on the other hand, this is a movie in which Chekhov's gun is actually Chekhov's 60-ton tank. That the Avengers works at all is pretty impressive, but that it works as well as it did? That's basically a miracle. Even less than a decade later, it's difficult to remember that this was the first time that anything like this had been attempted. A movie that combined characters who had been established in their own films, each with their own tone and style. In bringing them together, Joss Whedon had to balance the fantasy of Thor, the snarky sci-fi of Iron Man, and the sincere superheroics of Captain America, combining them all, along with Hulk, Hawkeye, and Black Widow, with stakes that were high enough to bring everyone together for a single adventure, and this movie does it. Those big stakes mostly result from an army of faceless aliens, but even that paid off years later in Avengers Infinity War, and Loki getting Hulk smashed like a Looney Tunes character was the most fun superhero movies had ever been. It's safe to say, Iron Man surprised us all. It's not that we expected it to be bad. Tony Stark's origin story is a pretty good fit for a Hollywood action movie. It had a great cast, and while director Jon Favreau might have been best known for Elf, that really wasn't a bad thing. But still, none of us expected it to be so good that it would become the foundation of the entire MCU. To say that it was an exceptionally powerful launch would be an understatement. There are times when this feels less like a superhero movie and more like a popcorn revenge flick where the hero just happens to have a flying suit of armor, but it did its job so well that those shortcomings are easy to forgive. Every set piece in Ant-Man and the Wasp plays with the idea of changing size. From the Wasp running along the blade of a knife to Ant-Man using a flatbed truck as a scooter. Through it all, this sequel is genuinely hilarious. After the relentless downer of Avengers Infinity War, this lighthearted take on superheroes with stakes far more personal than cosmic was a welcome tone shift. <laughs> what are you laughing? Please, can you just... Okay, okay. Arguably, the best thing about the MCU is that it feels like a shared universe in the same way that the comics do. The knowledge that Ant-Man and the Wasp and Infinity War happen at roughly the same time is maybe the best expression of that. Thanos is solemnly searching for the Infinity Stones while Scott Lang is running through an elementary school in a hoodie because he got stuck at three feet tall. And it all sets up a heck of a gut punch at the end. Six years after his original outing, the Sorcerer Supreme finally got his own sequel with Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, directed by the legendary Sam Raimi. In keeping with many of Raimi's earlier works, Multiverse of Madness is a tale tinged with horror. Here, Strange must use all his powers to protect America Chavez, a young girl with the ability to portal between universes, but only when she's truly terrified. And as it turns out, America is scared for a pretty good reason. The murderous, unhinged Scarlet Witch. The movie is a trippy journey into terror, but it's not all about scares. Multiverse of Madness is also fun, bringing in a ton of great cameos, showing glimpses of weird new worlds, and letting Strange really explore his magical abilities. Dark, yet never too dark, the Good Doctor sequel is just as strange as we were all hoping it would be. The first Avenger does origin stories better than most, and a lot of that has to do with Chris Evans. In a franchise that's full of amazing casting choices, Evans pulls off the incredible feat of embodying a square-jawed, relentlessly earnest product of the military-industrial complex in a way that makes him impossible not to like. For all that super strength, there's a character whose real superpower is making you believe in him. And that's exactly what this movie does. I'm gonna do this all day. 
as good as it was on its own, it also serves as the proof of concept for the superhero movie as a period piece, and gave the MCU a history that went further back than 2008 and Tony Stark's cave. The first Guardians of the Galaxy movie manages to balance so much stuff going on that you almost don't notice how complicated it is for all the fun you're having. It's got a team of lovable misfits dealing with their own issues while fighting against a massive threat, expansive interstellar empires, and a retro feel supported by a classic rock soundtrack that doesn't feel like it's wallowing in the past. All that and still tells a story so fun that it made Rocket Raccoon a household name. It breaks the formula in every way it can to the point where it's a superhero team movie that ends with a dance-off and the heroes literally saving the universe with the power of friendship. Far From Home is built around the question of what this universe looks like without its first superhero, Tony Stark. There's a void in the MCU that needs to be filled, and Spider-Man might just be the one to do it. That's why Mysterio's plot goes all the way back to the first Iron Man film and weaves through the entire MCU timeline. Making it all make sense to cap off another phase of the MCU was an amazing feat. All the good Spider-Man stuff is here. Peter Parker has to wrestle with responsibility and self-doubt, the romance with MJ is heartfelt and sweet, and there are serious consequences for Spider-Man always walking around with his mask off. There are world-shattering surprises and lots of fun special effects from a special effects wizard villain. It's a super fun time at the movie theater. There were some pretty heavy expectations for Captain Marvel given that it was the MCU's first film led by a woman. Luckily, it succeeded big time. Rather than falling into the tried and true Iron Man formula that had been used to introduce so many other MCU characters, Captain Marvel was a search for identity. That search took place over the backdrop of an intergalactic war, with the title character's potential mostly represented by the main character glowing with literal cosmic fire while she punched her way through spaceships. At times, Captain Marvel may come off as a little corny, but that corniness is a result of simply being very earnest and heartfelt, and at times, inspiring. My name is Carol. Between that, the cosmic action, and lots of jokes about the 90s, it lived up to the hype. The tragic loss of Chadwick Boseman looms large over Wakanda forever. The movie opens with news that Boseman's iconic character, T'Challa, has passed away. But Wakanda Forever isn't just a tearjerker. It's also funny, exciting, and action-packed. Director Ryan Coogler is on his A-game here, creating an enjoyable superhero film and honoring Boseman. Letitia Wright and Angela Bassett are also phenomenal as T'Challa's royal family. One assumes their tears aren't just acting, and while Boseman's presence is missed, these two provide the emotional strength we all need in the late actor's absence. Of course, the real scene stealer here is Tenoch Huerta as Namor the Submariner, the perfect foil for Shuri. Like her, he's also lost his family. He also knows what it's like having foreign forces invading your homeland, something Wakanda has been dealing with since T'Challa's death. While we question his methods, we never question his motives. As for Shuri herself, the movie bookends with the hero grappling with her brother's death, on one side resisting, on one side accepting. It's a truly beautiful transformation in a genuinely beautiful film. Everything about the Winter Soldier reinforces the idea that Captain America is exactly the guy you want to have the power to save the world. The notebook full of pop culture references that he needs to look up to understand the world around him, the friendship with Sam Wilson that starts with bonding over their wartime experience, the loyalty to his friends that leads him to risk his own life to save Bucky. He even gives his opponents one last chance to back out before he beats up an elevator full of traitors. All of these pieces add up to a whole that's incredible. Even before you get to how much of the movie is based around Steve Rogers just kicking the living hell out of bad guys. That stuff's pretty fun too. Marvel's ultimate goal with Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings was to repeat the success of Black Panther, according to Deadline. And that plan largely worked with critics agreeing it was a solid step toward better Asian representation in Hollywood. 
Shang-Chi doesn't stray very far from Marvel's tried and tested origin story formula, but it sets itself apart when it comes to action. Director Destin Daniel Cretton's movie pays homage to the fight choreography of Jackie Chan, as well as Chinese martial arts films past and present. Simu Liu brings the perfect blend of humility and heroism to the title role, while Aquafina, Tony Leung, and Michelle Yeoh are all on their A-games too. Add in a couple of unexpected cameos and you're on to a winner. Even though Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes are unquestionably the focus of Civil War, there's a pretty convincing argument to be made that this movie should have been called Avengers Civil War instead. It has everyone in it, and they aren't just cameos either. Ant-Man, Hawkeye, Scarlet Witch, and War Machine all get huge character-developing moments in the middle of a super-heroic Royal Rumble, while the Avengers are split by a villain who wound up getting exactly what he wanted. And if that wasn't enough, it's also the movie that introduced movie audiences to Black Panther and Spider-Man. The characters are never flattened out to fit, and the three-way fight at the end has not only some of the best action in the MCU, but some of the most emotional moments too. After his debut in Civil War, T'Challa's first solo movie came with some pretty high expectations. Not only did it live up to them, it blew right past them for one of the MCU's best movies. Maybe it's because Chadwick Boseman's T'Challa is a character struggling with the weight of expectations himself. Black Panther is more than up to the challenge, but the journey he takes to get there is full of compelling complications. From the reveal that his father wasn't the flawlessly honorable man that he thought, to an enemy with some very justifiable anger at the world around him. It's a superhero struggle that goes far beyond just the punch-out battle in the climax. Black Panther never shies away from its high-tech comic book roots, but tells a story that's very much rooted in the real world and does it beautifully. More than any other superhero movie, Infinity War captures the feeling of an epic comic book crossover. There are multiple interconnected stories going on at the same time, each with its own flavor, bridging different story arcs and making sure every single character gets a moment in the spotlight. When it comes together at the end, it's a fight across multiple planets where the unbelievably high stakes become very real for both the characters and the fans who have been invested in these movies for a full 10 years. That's a tough enough bit of storytelling to pull off well even in comic books, and they've had decades of practice. Seeing it done here, in a single movie that still has the feeling of encompassing a whole universe? No other movie has ever done that, and it's hard to imagine another one doing it this well. As good as it is on its own, the fact that Peter Parker swings into action after 15 other movies means we don't have to waste time with an origin story. Thematically, Homecoming builds on everything that came before in a truly incredible way with direct callbacks to Tony Stark's character arc that show how different Peter is from the hero he's trying to impress. The idea of a superhero universe erupting around otherwise normal people is the conflict that drives everything about the movie. Take that away and you've still got great characters, great action, and one of the best scenes in the franchise. With it, though, you've got pure magic. To say that Ragnarok lifts heavily from Walt Simonson's epic mid-80s run of The Mighty Thor is putting it mildly. The only things in this movie that weren't directly inspired by Simonson are the pieces it pulls directly from Marvel's more recent Planet Hulk storyline, right down to the Hulk's gladiator gear. The thing is, Taika Waititi's film chops up all those pieces and rearranges them into something that's both different and genuinely hilarious. That part isn't surprising, considering that before Ragnarok, Waititi was probably best known for co-directing the vampire mockumentary What We Do in the Shadows, but it takes advantage of Chris Hemsworth's infuriatingly good comedic timing. Ow. Sad to be sure. Three generations of Spider-Man movies collide spectacularly in Spider-Man No Way Home. Tom Holland's Peter Parker is once again the main focus, but No Way Home is closer to an Avenger-style team-up than the two films that precede it. Doctor Strange plays a huge role, but some characters from outside the MCU show up too. 
in what was one of the worst kept secrets in MCU history, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield appear to offer Holland's Peter Parker sage advice and much needed comfort in the fight to save the lives of the villains from those two actors' own Spider-Man flicks. Holland finally gets his with great power comes great responsibility moment, and it's one that you won't forget. The Brit turns in his most accomplished performance as Spidey, backed up by the all-star supporting cast. No Way Home is the best Spider-Man movie to date. Endgame could have gone wrong really easily. It's meant to serve as the climax of the 21 movies before it in the first saga of the MCU, so saying that Marvel pulled it off is saying that they pretty much achieved a miracle. The film is loaded with callbacks in ways that you don't even realize until you stop to think about them. Captain America's support group, New Asgard, Black Widow wiping out the red in her ledger, and the list goes on. It's payoff after payoff, but it never feels like pure fan service. It really does feel like an ending. Plus, Endgame has plenty of great moments on its own. The time travel hijinks, the debut of Professor Hulk, the audacity of skipping ahead five years, and the sheer fist-pumping awesomeness of Cap tightening up his shield and standing alone against the apocalypse. It really is the thundering climax fans have wanted from the start. Is that everyone? I can want it more.